Hello, everybody. Welcome into a Thursday edition of the Computer America Show. We show plan for you tonight. Home automation is the topic. We're going to be talking to one of the leaders in home automation tonight. Crestron is here with us in the first hour. And then in hour two, we'll have computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show. And One minute until showtime. As you hear, we'll be starting in less than a minute. Thirty seconds. <clears throat> Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I am your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And welcome into a Thursday edition of the Computer America Show. Boy, lots of excitement. Things go, of course, tomorrow we're going to have our show reminder winner of the week. That's always something fun to look forward to. And, of course, just the fact it's going to be Friday tomorrow. Uh, but here we are on the 2nd of October already. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, we have a great show planned for you. Of course, in hour two, we're going to have uh, computer and technology news. That's brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. And also, uh, in the first hour, we're going to discuss the topic of home automation. Now, we've done that uh, recently with Mike Riley. He actually did a book on home automation. Uh, very knowledgeable gentleman. But tonight, uh, we actually uh, have uh, a company, one of the leaders in uh, home automation and I'm very pleased to have them and, and uh, just as a side note we here at the Crossman household use the Crestron system. We have a full Crestron system in our home. been very pleased with it um, and we'll discuss a little bit of that but they're here to talk about some of their one of their latest uh, in their, their home automation technologies called the Ping and uh, <laughs> we'll be talking about that uh, with them uh, momentarily. So uh, uh, um, uh, ben, uh, anything else you want to mention uh, before we get started uh, here on the show? No, I think we should jump right into it. Okay, well, let's do it because uh, uh, I'm really look, uh, looking forward to this. I mean, uh, I know when I was, uh, I know I, I always promised myself that when I, you know, got my own home finally, um, I was going to automate it with a, a Crestron system because it was just like the state of the art at the time. Uh, but Crestron, as I said, is considered by many to be the leading provider of control and automation systems for your home. Uh, with so many home automation systems out there, you know, that's really saying something. Crestron has proven to and continues to be an industry leader when it comes to home automation. Now here to tell us why and to talk about their latest system, the Crestron Ping, is Tom Barnett. Uh, Tom is the Director of Marketing for Crestron. Hey Tom, welcome into Computer America. How are you? I'm doing well, Craig. How are you? All right, fine. So, you know, I know about Crestron. I've known about Crestron for years, but, uh, you know, there's so many home automation systems and auto office automation systems out there. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about Crestron itself, how long you've been out, and, uh, and a little background behind Crestron. Sure. Uh, so Crestron is actually uh, nearly 50 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a, the company was started in, uh, in Crestkill, New Jersey, so Crestkill Electronics, mm -hmm. Crestron. 
Uh, our founder is a gentleman we're all very proud to work for, uh, Mr. George Feldstein. And he's only and, 26, right? Uh, <laughs> something like that, right? Exactly, yeah. Company, he started a company 50 years ago, but he's only, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, and so um, he basically uh, started off really uh, more in the commercial AV side, bringing uh, good control and automation solutions to that market, and then uh, went on to expand into the residential market as well. Is he, a, is, is he an electronics engineer of some sort person, or did he do it from the marketing standpoint, or did he actually design the, these early systems? Uh, he is an engineer's engineer. Uh, so the, the story, story goes that he... Uh, and it, sometimes the best thing to do would be to find a recording of him telling the story, of course. Uh, <laughs> but as the story goes, he'll tell people, uh, well, the reason I started my own company is that I, I had my own ideas about how to build things, and every time I tried to be an engineer for somebody else, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work out very well. And I realized if I wanted to keep food on the table, I was, I was going to have to start my own thing where I could be the boss. There you go. All right. It's fun being the boss, you know, I have to say that. So that makes a lot of sense. And, of course, over the years, the product has developed. Now, now you said originally started... Uh, uh, for what for for companies for a large companies or for homes? I mean, where what what market did he begin? Did Christron begin in? Uh, so the original product was an automated slide projector controller because, yeah. of course, when you start to talk about the number of years ago that we're talking about, that was the in fact the state of the art in uh, in presentation technology. Right. No, and no, no PowerPoint exactly. <laughs> well, you you needed ways to control more than one slide projector, make them coordinate together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you know one thing led to another, and now we're uh, we're into all sorts of different automation from audio and video distribution systems, uh, which is a major part of the company now. Uh, we make a, a product called Digital Media that will distribute any sort of analog or digital video signal uh, over copper or fiber, so very long distances, very large systems. Um, and then we're also, of course, in home automation, a lot of it's lighting control. Uh, we make our own motorized shades, um, and so it's a uh, it's a pretty cool company to work for. Um, so in in New Jersey, our campus uh, has about six buildings. There's our we have a, a huge distribution center that's actually being doubled in size right now. Um, two manufacturing facilities, so we're making circuit boards and assembling products uh, right in New Jersey. Um, research center and. It's just a really exciting environment to be in where you can walk from the place where we had the idea right across the street to where we're building it and shipping it to customers. Well, now, you know, I've, as I said, I've known about Crestron for years, and, and one of the things that I thought was really, you know, sexy was the, uh, the, the screens that you could see with Crestron. You had this, like, little control panel that, you, uh, that would display in color, you know, all the different con control elements of a home. And uh, this was many, many years ago, and I said to myself that, you know, if I ever have my own home, uh, I, would, uh, I would probably, you know, want to put in a Crestron system uh, in the home. And yeah, I, I, I was just thinking, you know, you said that you like the little screens, but that sounds like many people, you know, as soon as you say that, they say, well, I mean, that's a tablet nowadays. That's, yeah, but that's, you know, that's just second nature. This was pre-tablet. This was pre-smartphone. This is this is you know you know uh, many 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 years ago, uh, where I saw the Crestron panel. You know there was like a little remote panel that could sit there on a desktop, and I said that's so cool. You know when uh, when I do get my own home, I'm gonna probably want to put some, one of those in. So uh, uh, and then you know flash forward uh, to about uh, I guess maybe about seven years ago, uh, we finally bought a home. And the home uh, didn't have it had it had uh, the wiring in the home where you couldn't walk into a room and flip a switch and on off switch. Each room didn't have its on off switch. The the person who designed the home uh, thought he was being clever, and so he had all the rooms lighting and everything in the walls coming back to a home run, which is like in the pantry of the kitchen, and everything kind of met there. And so, and he had a little PC of some sort running God knows what version of Windows, an early version, uh, trying to run the house and everything, and it was just, it was really bad. And so, uh, we basically had to pull all that out, and then we said, well, what are we going to put in? And of course, the first thing I said, well, let's, let's you know, we got to put a Crestron system in, because... Uh, there were some systems being offered by some other companies, but that could replace your light switches in the in the wall, and they would be radio controlled, and you can control them. But again, we didn't have that. The house wasn't set up that way. It was uh, as many homes are now sort of like central wiring, where everything goes back to the central uh, one center place. 
And so, uh, and of course, that's a perfect installation for Crestron. So we we had a Crestron panel put in. Actually, we have two panels. We have one upstairs and one downstairs, um, because we have so many different rooms with so many light lighting fixtures, and and uh, it's quite elaborate. And to drop one of those in, I have to say, uh, not, it wasn't an easy job. I mean, uh, it, it took a lot of it, because once they put it in, then they have to program it and they have to set it up, and that's part of the thing that Crestron does. Um, uh, and that's what we had to go through. Now, uh, today, um, I would think that uh, people might not have to go through quite that painful a process. Um, I, and I know you have some new systems here, but basically, was that basically what, what you had to do? Was you had to go in and you had to have Crestor come in and put the panels in and then program all the different you know setups and everything? Is it still pretty much like that? Um, so we actually, uh, so Crestron manufactures uh, the products and, and sometimes we talk about it as uh, we have these 3,000 different parts yeah. <laughs> that you can use to do a whole lot of different custom things, you know, yeah. board, boardrooms, emergency operations centers, college classrooms, yeah. homes, people, all kinds of parts get used different ways. And if you think of, of us as making sort of paint and painting supplies, then we have this network of integrators um, you, mostly they're, they're companies who started in the audio video business uh, who know how to use that paint to make whatever whatever picture you're looking to make on the canvas um, and so you were probably working with uh, with some Crestron authorized dealer who's an integrator yes. in the area yep. and mm -hmm. a lot of their expertise was knowing you know some of the technical side but also some of the artistic side like hey we're gonna make these lighting scenes for you mm -hmm. you've never sat around thinking about what lighting scenes you want but they they know how to give you that basic set that that sort of make it worth having your lighting systems automated. Yes, and uh, and it, it was a I can't say it was a smooth easy process. I'm sorry, but it, it took some time. It took it uh, over. It took actually a, a number of months to get it pretty much where we wanted to get it. And uh, but how much of that was reversing the mistakes of the past and implementing the new one? Like like yeah. if you just had a complete you know switch home. Would it be would it have been easier or oh, like you know quicker? Yeah, it would have been a lot easier. But uh, as again, the the home, as I said, wasn't s switched. Like each room had its own set of on-off switches, uh, and, and because of that, we had to put this in. And again, the programming uh, set up, they had to have you know obviously people who were trained with Crestron with the software to you know put the delays in and the fading up and the fading down. I mean, it's 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 and we had like three floors of that you know that we had to do that with different rooms, so it was an elaborate process. And then of course. Uh, Part of the way through, our Crest, uh, our Crestron dealer uh, was really uh, he the guy who, re who had the Crestron, um, you know, uh, uh, franchise for the area turned out to be not so uh, scrupulous, and he left for South America and left us holding the bag. So it was a whole. It was yeah. That's I, a fluke, I, though. That's a fluke. Yeah, that was a fluke. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in retrospect, if I had done it, I would have done it differently. But now we have a a, a person who is you know a, a company that's authorized and has been so for a long time. And they're doing a terrific, terrific job. That's no reflection on Crestron. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, Crestron went above and beyond with our home and uh, made sure that it was uh, going to be done correctly. So when they contacted the new dealer, uh, they said, "Hey, we got to make this right and fix it," and uh, and and they did. So that's very, very cool. But I don't want to. I don't want to uh, uh, get into that because that was a, an unusual situation for the average person who wants to put a Crestron system home. Uh, they have such a wide variety of technologies that they can do today. And one of the things we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, Tom, is uh, something called the Crestron Ping, spelled P-Y-N-G. And uh, this really looks to me like it takes advantage of, of today's technology because now we have tablets and we have smartphones. We have all these things that we didn't have, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, um, and it's, it seems to me that a lot of the home automation systems are turning to these technologies because they're so, you know, ubiquitous. You know, everybody seems to have one. So uh, uh, why don't you comment a little bit about that and then we'll, we'll get into the, uh, uh, what the Crestron Ping is all about. Sure. So, uh, so the idea with Crestron Ping is, of course, you know, we observe what you did, which is that our our integrators uh, had to write a computer. They would load that into your house. They would run around checking to see if things worked the way that they were that you'd asked for. They'd show it to you. They'd make a list of things. They'd go change in the program. They'd compile it. They'd load it again. Yes. Um, and we said, okay, well, you know, that helped us build a great company, and it, it's it's still an important set of tools that we have because it gives you a lot of customization that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, with with the ability, all the technology that we have now, uh, things have really changed, right? So now you have an app for keeping track of what wines 
did you drink? You have an app for keeping track of what time you sleep at night. You have apps for all sorts of crazy things. Mm -hmm. How come we don't have an app to, to make the house go, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the idea with Crestron Ping was to basically start with all of the hardware that we have. We have a great lineup of all these widgets that you can control in your house and have those all work natively with an app where you can set up the whole automation system as you're walking through the house. So as you were installing each individual dimmer, uh, you wouldn't have to wait to put a big controller in. You wouldn't have to wait to write some master program and test it. You would just simply be saying, oh, I'm in the bedroom. I'm going to add the three light, three dimmers that are in the bedroom. Okay, they're in it. And then treat all of your scenes and things the same way you treat settings for all of your other apps, where you might go into your email and say, no, I want to download two weeks worth of email, not just one. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why can't you have it be just as easy to say, no, I want the lights to turn on an hour before sunset, not an hour after, right? So, so it sounds to me like what you're now doing is giving the consumer the power to do what uh, with the older systems you had to have an authorized Crestron installer do. Uh, you're now giving that ability to the actual customer, the end user. Uh, certainly a lot of the customization, um, right, making an event, setting up something on a schedule, changing what a keypad did, uh, we definitely wanted to empower you know, anybody who could use a tablet, you know, anybody in the family, uh, maybe different people within the integrator um, so that you can have the guy who's putting the light switches in for you just get it mostly working for you and not have to, not have to wait for a second person to come out. Um, right. The product is still, it's, you know, we make custom window treatments where we have to measure your window and somebody installs oh, sure. it in a pocket and runs a wire, so it's still meant to be a, a custom installed product, yes. um, but we wanted to speed the process up and make it much easier for the, the homeowner to make changes themselves. Now, I would, I would suspect that also the cost involved. Um, I know what I had to pay for our Crestron system, and uh, today what the typical person will pay with, with a ping system uh, I would think, uh, well, why don't you tell us about how, how, how have costs uh, in home automation come? How, how affordable is, uh, is a ping system for the average home these days? Um, yeah, so a lot of things have, you know, change over time in technology, obviously. Uh, at the beginning, you were talking about, about touch screens, mm -hmm. and for a long time, you know, that was the thing that Crestron is best known for. You'd walk into most companies' boardrooms, and there'd be this thing that said Crestron on the bottom, mm -hmm. and... Nobody, you, there was no other time you used a touch screen because it was 1992, you know, and wow, it's a touch screen. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was a big part of the business. And because we were one of a very small number of companies making them, you know, it, they were expensive products. And yes, yeah. as the technology curve has been ridden, you know, boy, you wouldn't believe the prices you can get on Gorilla Glass now, right? You know, it's, <laughs> a, it's a big market. And so it's, it's not a not a crazy custom product to need a seven inch touch screen anymore. Um, so that's definitely helped out tremendously. Um, and then, uh, you know, another big factor is just the time that the installers are spending on things. So those, uh, those months of time that you had, uh, which it sounds like there was definitely a reverse engineering mission going on there, which yes. sometimes there is on a takeover. Right. But, uh, you know, all that time, those are people not working on something else. So it ends up becoming a, a factor in the cost. And so the better we can make the tools so that you can get in and out faster, you can make the, the labor part of it more efficient. And then certainly, uh, you know, that the, the technology is always making the components less expensive over time as well. All right. Uh, we are talking to Tom Barnett. Tom is the Director of Marketing Communications for Crestron. If you have a question or, uh, for him or a comment or a suggestion, give us a call at 347-884-8881. That's 347-884-8881. I'll get you on and get you through. Email is live, L-I-V-E, at computeramerica.com. If you don't want to go on the air but you still have a question, that's a great, great way to reach us. You can also join us on, on our live interactive chat room from our homepage at computeramerica.com. You'll see a button that says live video and chat. Just click that. You'll see a split screen really on the left hand. You'll see our live IRC chat room. It asks you for a nickname. That's a name you'll be known by when you go in there. Uh, it'll ask you for a capture code, which is usually a number or two words. That just uh, proves that you're a live human being and not a, a robot. Uh, uh, click the connect button and your browser will move you into the chat room. It uh, makes a little window. It's really simple. If you want that window to be in its own area, we have some IRC clients. We have a button there like Chatzilla or HexChat. 
uh, depending upon the platform and browser that you're using, so it'll actually format it for you uh, nicely and uh, make its own separate window. But that's completely optional. It's up to you. Uh, you can do that. And also, you can watch the, not, the Computer America show. Not only listen to it, but watch it on our live Computer America streaming video page. And that's brought to you by Other World Computing. Quality products, expert support since 1988. They're celebrating their 25th anniversary. They are the award-winning Other World Computing. In August, they won two Stevie Awards from the American Business Association. If you have any computing needs for your PC, for your Mac, for your PlayStation 4, for your Xbox One, you're looking for hard drives, anything that attaches to a computer or the computers themselves, visit them at www.macsales, M-A-C-S-A-L-E-S dot com for some of the best deals. Anything over 49 bucks, you get free ground shipping, which means about 80% of the country you get your, your order in two days. That's really nice. Uh, they have their own uh, YouTube channel for installation videos. They have their own blog. Just go over there, www.maxsales.com. You'll be glad you did and find some really great values. All right, so uh, as I said, we're talking to Crestron, and uh, um, Tom uh, Barnett is the uh, uh, Director of Marketing for uh, Crestron Communications. We're talking right now about the their Crestron ping system. Typically, why don't you name some of the ping accessories and, and, and how many accessories can you add to uh, the ping system? I know I know they've, 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 my question, there was a certain limitation to how many you could put in and you had the, all these control modules. Uh, I'm assuming that since those days they've simplified things quite a bit. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, you know, what devices you can use to control? Uh, sure. with the, yeah. mm -hmm. sure. So the idea with Ping, of course, like we were saying, was to be able to set everything up right from your iPad. And so we wanted to start with the most basic and important parts of your, your home control system, which is all the parts that we, we think of it as what relates to your environment. Mm -hmm. So it's got lighting control, uh, motorized window treatments, shades and draperies, mm -hmm. uh, security system integration, uh, your thermostat control, and then your door locks. And so all of those things you can set up right from your iPad. Now, when you say security, I mean, do you work with security companies like ADT or something, or do you have your own? Uh, uh, how does that work? So uh, we make an interface box that connects up uh, via Ethernet, and then you connect that to a security panel that would be put in by your security company. So you still have, you, know, you probably have the keypad from them somewhere. But uh -huh. you can also then, if you want to access to arm or disarm with your code on your iPad, you can do that as well. Okay, and who? So you you set that up. Then do I have to call the alarm company in to wire that, or they say, well, we don't know how that because that's a question. I mean, you got maybe you have two different companies pointing their fingers at each other. Who's in charge of hooking everything together? If you have both the alarm system already and you have the Crestron ping on, who connects them? Yeah, so the, the sort of demarcation point is that connection between the Crestron system and your security system. Mm -hmm. So your security contract, the security company is going to put in all right. their sensors, the panel, right. and then that, that interface point, um, which, you know, if you disconnected it, the security system still works. You just can't tell it what to do from your home automation system. Sure. Sure. And then certain events that you want to set up, like, you know, one of the popular ones, of course, is if the alarm's going off, you should yeah. turn all the lights on the house on automatically, right? You, I bet you want the lights on when the alarm's going off. Yes. Um, so then that interface point gets put in by the, the Crestron integrator uh, who connects that wire up and makes sure it's working for you. Okay, good. All right. All right, so uh, so some of the, you mentioned the lighting, uh, you mentioned a thermostat, you mentioned uh, home uh, window treatments. Uh, uh, how 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 big a window? How what what size shades do you make? Uh, uh, I mean, from the smallest window to what? What do you have these big you know uh, uh, panoramic windows? I mean, how big can you cover? So we make a wide variety of shades. So we will make a shade that's as narrow as 17 inches, uh, or with a single roller mm -hmm. as wide as about 10 feet or 12 feet. And wow. then for really large windows, what happens is that there's normally the piece of glass isn't quite that large, so there'll be some dividing item, and then you'll put d multiple rollers on the same window that you can control in unison. Mm. Okay, so you have a wide variety then of uh, of um, different uh, uh, shades, and then of course uh, the material itself. I mean, how you know? I assume you offer a variety of of, of uh, the material. You know, uh, you want it to be translucent. You want it to be blackout. That type of thing. Uh, what cut? What colors? I mean, do you you get into the designer end of that as well? Yeah, and so uh, designer's the word there because uh, very often this is the part of the project where uh, now you need to work with 
if there's an interior decorator working on the project. Uh, if, if not, this is the one part of the project where, you know, whoever's also buying the sofa gets real interested in what's going on with the home automation because now you're putting something in the window. Um, so we have a, a selection of fabrics. Uh, there's about 500 fabrics that are available. Mm -hmm. And as you point out, uh, they have different properties. So you'll, you'll select um, an openness factor, which is a, a percentage that tells you how much light is gets through that fabric. Mm -hmm. So a 1% shade will let through 1% of the light that uh, would be coming through if there was no shade down. Mm -hmm. um, and so a sort of what, what people consider a translucent fabric might be 3 to 4 to 5%, which means, you know, you can see shapes through it. There's no surprise about what's going on the other side, but you definitely have set up some privacy. But most importantly, you're also reducing the amount of UV and heat that's coming into the house and light that's coming into the house by 95% um, nice. if you're at 5% openness. And so uh, if you, the, the most valuable thing to do is to set up schedules that when you want heat, the side of the house that faces the sun has the shades open. And when you don't want heat, that side of the house has the, wind, the shades closed. Now, what kind of shades are they? Are they like draperies that go from the left to the right, or are they the ones that go up and down? And uh, are they do they like? Uh, um, I mean, what kind of sh what kind of shades do you offer? Uh, yes, so both <laughs> both of those kinds, and then also skylight shades, which which go up from the bottom more or less. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So it's uh, that so that's like a roller shade that normally uh, you, when you have a roller shade, you put a weight in the bottom of it, which they call a hem bar. And it's very simple because you have gravity on your side, and so you 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 turn a little roller, and gravity pulls it down. And then when you want to pull it up, you turn the motor the other direction. Uh, skylight shade works just like that, except that the gravity goes the wrong way. So you have to build a track mm -hmm. so that you have the roller at the bottom, and then basically push the uh, the fabric up. But you obviously have all the different uh, types and assortments uh, to accommodate whatever the. Uh, the homeowner's needs might be, and, uh, and 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 you need to have that. Uh, I assume that you you have different colors, or is that are they all neutral, or or do you have a, a palette of colors that people can choose from? Uh, so when I say there's 500 fabrics, the difference is there. Sometimes it's the amount of openness. A lot of it's the color. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get a a bright red shade if you want. You can get a neutral shade. Okay. Um, it's one of those things where when you're flipping through the book, you know, your eyes get real big when you see that nice blue pattern with the red circles on it. <laughs> and then you realize that you're buying a window treatment, which you might have for a little while, maybe yeah. even longer than the chair. And uh, I would say 90% of it ends up being a neutral shade by the time the, yeah. the order actually comes in. Uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. Unless <laughs> you want an optical, uh, most people will go for a neutral color. Uh, and, and then, then uh, yeah, and then another uh, common thing to do is that when we were talking about the openness, uh, it, you know, oh, I have to make this, you know, do I want to let some light in or do I want to make a blackout? Um, and so often what happens is we'll make a dual roller shade, so there'll be two rollers in the same shade. We'll have maybe a 5% openness translucent fabric that you use during the day to cut down on glare on your TV to keep light uh -huh. out. But if you're watching a movie during the day and you want to just make it black, mm -hmm. you then you close the other roller, uh, which is the the blackout roller in that case. So in other words, ro you can have more than one shade in the uh, in the uh, in the control. You can have one control one unit that can two different shades. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So you have two motors in the same window. Mm -hmm. um, so up in the pocket, they're like sort of vertically above each other, mm -hmm. and so you've got the usually the blackout fabric uh, towards the outside of the house and the translucent fabric inside, mm -hmm. um, so that you can control your light even to an even greater degree. Okay, and depending about how big your windows, it's all you know. That's obviously a factor too, and 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 uh, um, uh, that and and of course the, what you mentioned was the 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 sizes. Uh, like 10 feet. I mean, obviously, you 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 have the units to cover, probably from the smallest window to uh, the largest one. Uh, you're prepared. That's right, and it it also a, a factor is when you get involved with the project. So if it's a new construction home, you you build a nice pocket, and the roller goes inside that pocket above the window, and all, all you ever see of the shade is that there's some fabric coming down from a little slit, um, and you can add that after the fact. Of course, it's more difficult. Um, in a retrofit installation, uh, you'll also sometimes just have the roller standing off from the wall, 
uh, mm. on a on a bracket that has metal fascia around it and still very stylish, but a different look. Now I got to ask you. I see you're in your home. You're obviously doing this from your home. I mean, do you have a crest run system <laughs> in your home, or, uh, or or are you thinking about it? Or do you not take your or do you not take your work home with you? <laughs> yeah, uh, it it would not be very credible for me to be on this call if I did not have a crest run system in the home. So I I do in fact take my work home from with me. All right, so you could dim those lights that we're looking in the ceiling and dim them and make them go back up. You have a control away. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, so the lights behind me are my living room room lights, and ah, if I okay. decide we want them off, then we'll tap the off button, and they're off. Yeah, they're off. They're off. So they completely control. All right. You see, the man does take his work home, and he takes it seriously. Yeah, well, exactly. And he's doing it from his smartphone, too, a, a, a touch screen. You know? But there you are. Touch screens are everywhere today, obviously, with smartphones and tablets. Uh, certainly a natural uh, uh, migration uh, to, to the, today's technology. Um, we're going to take a little break. We're at the bottom of the hour, Tom, and then uh, we'll, we'll do some commercial messages and then we'll come back to you, okay? Okay. Uh, you're listening to the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, on the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. Crestron is our guest this hour. Tom Barnett, Director of Marketing and Communications for Crestron, is here with us. Any questions about home automation? We're here to answer. This is the show to be. Again, 347-884-8881. Uh, or live at ComputerAmerica.com. Two ways to reach the show. You're listening to the Computer America Show. We'll be right back just in a few minutes. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, have you heard about the No No Hair Removal Device that's sweeping the globe? If you want to go weeks without shaving and get smooth, professional quality results, here's our favorite host, Cheryl, for No No Hair Removal. Thanks. Hey gals, I love talking about my No No. It's this cute little hair removal system that you can take with you and use almost anywhere at home or on the road. No more expensive in-office treatments, painful waxing, and no more wasting your valuable time. Got unwanted facial hair? No No has patented Thermacon technology that works on all hair and skin colors, so it's perfect for using on all body parts. And now you can take advantage of this incredible risk-free trial. Get the No-No, the facial kit, a travel case, and a $100 discount shopping card, and you don't risk a penny to try it. Try the incredible No-No hair completely risk-free. Call 1-800-953-5415. That's 800-953-5415. 800-953-5415. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting. The mission is to protect and enhance the lives of companion animals and the people who love them. Their no-kill rescue shelter is open year-round, making it easy for people to adopt their best new friend. This year, Brother Wolf will find homes for over 2,400 orphan dogs, puppies, cats, and kittens. All have ended up as an orphan through no fault of their own. Brother Wolf has created a safe, nurturing environment where these special animals can heal emotionally and physically until they find a lifelong home. Their life-saving transport program brings dogs and puppies from overcrowded shelters in the south to rescues in the north where homes are easier to find. Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is a 501c3 organization. To learn more about their and to make a donation, visit their website at www.bwar.org. That's www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? Buenas noches, this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, the Black & Decker 20V Hand Vac. 20V, as you might guess, stands for 20 volts, the power system behind this thing. And when you dock it on its charging stand, the new 20V Max Cordless Swivel Hand Black & Decker is roughly the size of a carton of juice. Push a button to swivel its snorkel nozzle for the job at hand. You can also flip a brush into place or slide a crevice tool in or out of the nozzle. We're still talking about everything between the nozzle and the handle. It's a cylindrical duct. One supports another level of tool-free disassembly that makes it easy to remove and wash or every six to nine months replace. A pre-filter and a filter that keep the captured dust inside the cup. The biggest plus in this product is the 20-volt lithium-ion battery that keeps the overall weight down 
while maintaining a higher voltage longer for better continuing suction that doesn't fade. Its small nozzle isn't for huge jobs, but it's really cool for drawing out dust from inside PCs, from keyboards, from atop monitors, and especially for putting the black back in all those dusty, dingy, green <laughs> wall warts and charging hubs on our shelves. Bottom line, the Black & Decker Pivot 20-volt Max Hand Vac makes doing lots of small chores no big deal. This is Marty Winston with the News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. Thank you, Marty Winston. Uh, we have Tom uh, Tom Barnett right here, uh, right here, and we're you know talking to Crush on, and uh, you know we're going over some of the accessories. We just did shades and things like that. Real quick, um, the app that uh, that that Crush on Ping uses, you know, that you can put on your smartphone or on your tablet, what have you. Um, are there like a like a limited number of keys that you can use? Like, like you know, if I go visit Craig and I want to, you know, and, and he happened to have a Crush on Ping. You know, could I just download the app and you know start messing with his lighting system, or do or 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 is it like you know four phones, four tablets, and that's it? Uh, so there's no limit to the number of devices that can connect. The app itself is is free, so you just go get that from the app store. Uh, we certainly wanted this scenario for selfish marketing reasons that if you had your friends over at your house and they were staying in the guest room, that they could get the app and try it out, right? So. Uh, now you you can set it up to require a password to connect, and there's levels to that where maybe Craig has a password where he can change the schedule, and you you're allowed in to turn the lights on and off in your bedroom. You know you could do things like that. Okay, so so there are different levels of authority when letting people in. You know, using your app, it's not just all or nothing. Right, right, because uh, it well you'd almost have to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. Hmm? Well, go ahead. No, uh, and you know, and just getting back to some of the accessories that you can use with Crestron Ping, you know, uh, lighting was the obvious one, shades that, that you just mentioned, and then uh, it says here that you also have uh, thermostats, which would be you know another really convenient one. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we've uh, we have thermostats that replace existing thermostats and then uh, get added to our wireless mesh network, um, so that you can then add it to the rest of your automation system. Um, and then there's ways to add sensors in other locations. So if you want to put the thermostat back by the furnace and just have a tiny little, it's like the size of a quarter, and you can paint it sensor inside the room, you can do that. Thermostats really seem to be the big thing. I mean, with when Nest came out with their their uh, thermostat, uh, uh, these uh, control systems. I mean, uh, Honeywell came as, has a a variety. Of them. There 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 are actually a number. You, you walk into a Home Depot today. I mean, they, they sell them right there. You can you can buy these things there. They're making them so easily accessible. Uh, I I'm wondering because we haven't done that. We uh, we uh, is it is a simple matter that if you have a thermostat, this just replaces the thermostat regardless of what kind of air conditioning system it, do we have. For example, we have a geothermal system, and it's quite elaborate, but it all centers around a thermostat. So is it just or do we need a technician to come in and really do something like that? Uh, you can probably replace your thermostat yourself uh, pretty easily. Um, the, the tricky part is, like with any low voltage project, just making sure that you know which wire is which. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's a couple of different ways that people talk about them. So in the instruction manual that comes with a replacement with a smart thermostat, they'll usually put a fair amount of energy into it. I know we certainly do making sure, okay, so if you have a heat pump, it's going to look like this. If you have uh, you know, a, a standard uh, an air conditioning compressor outside, it's going to look like this. And uh, and then you connect a few things up there and, and you're up and running. But what if you have nothing that looks like that? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. If you have a geothermal system with a reverse chiller outside, and you know, I mean, it gets you know, and and a separate, uh, you know, we, we, ours is you know, it's pretty weird, you know, and uh, and uh, we have this one guy who's sort of checked out on it, and uh, if he ever leaves town, we're, we're in a world of hurt. I guess we're gonna have to find another company. But but the the point you is, you have to find a new geo. Yeah, uh, I mean, do you deal with the exotic system again? If it all goes down to a sta standard thermostat, which it does, I mean, for the most part, I can tell. Uh, you, can you just bring it in an air conditioning person to put it in for you? You can say, yeah, is it pretty straightforward? I mean, they're going to know how to do it, or is that something that a Crestron dealer does? Uh, 
Both, any of those people could. Um, so if you handed a Crestron thermostat to uh, your HVAC technician, mm -hmm. um, it would look like any other thermostat to him, and okay. he would he would connect the wires in the same places, and uh, and then there's a process where you you'd pair it with the ping system so you could make it part of the rest of your Crestron system. All right. um, alternately, a, a Crestron dealer would have done this before, and it would be pretty comfortable with uh, okay. with hooking up because the by the time it gets to the thermostat, the connection get is is pretty standardized, really. Okay, well, that's I'm glad to hear that. And these these are just concerns that I'm sure that people would have. Now, but again, Crestron has its own thermostat. You're not working with things like Nest or some of these others, right? You, Crestron, you have your own branded thermostat. Is that correct? Uh, so we do make a Crestron branded thermostat, um, and we've we've made it for a long time. Uh, we're we were also part of the Works with Nest program, so. Uh, we work with them to have a driver so that you can have a Nest thermostat and control oh. that from your Crestron system as well. Okay, so you, so you not only, so it sounds to me like you, you're, you're working not only with the Crestron components, but Crestron is working with other companies who have uh, made a recognize, uh, or recognized in the industry uh, with the, yeah, the, and you have drivers and things that will, uh, will make your system work with them. Yeah, so when you uh, you look at Crestron over the long period, you know, uh, let's say 20 years ago, um, we didn't make much other than control systems at that point. We made a controller, you put programs into it, you had a touch screen. And so in those days, uh, our, our business was about interfacing with these products from other companies. And so there's a very strong tradition of that. And it's a very important part of what has, has built our company up is being able to make this thing talk to that thing another third thing happen when this other fourth thing tells us to do something. Mm -hmm. um, our own video switchers and lighting control systems and shades mm -hmm. is that when we're interfacing, we can only do as much automation as that product thought about integrating into its control API or its protocol. And there would always be something that people wanted to do that we'd want to add and we do said we can make a better overall automation system if we can set out to make that integration be part of it at the time we're designing it. Um, and so that's what has led us to, to manufacture all the different things that we do. Mm, exactly. Well, as I said, uh, uh, Crestron, again, is an industry leader. Now, now the ping system, um, are you finding in this day and age that the ping is really now the uh, the control unit of choice for hope, the typical home owner today, or do you still find that there are other systems? Some of your other systems are still um, more popular. I mean, uh, uh, speak because because you have a variety of systems, including like the one that we have here too, which is the whole master control unit, which uh, we discussed. Uh, what's what's proving to be the most popular? So uh, what will often happen is that you'll end up wanting to have a, a ping system, which you use for all the environmental things that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a more traditional, I guess you would say, Crestron control processor that you would use for things like audio and video distribution, which are often a big part. Um, and those things do lend themselves a little better to programming with the computer because you need to figure out how to talk to X, Y, and Z brand TV, set up which video its inputs are going to be used on the routing system and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the two systems can talk to one another. Um, so you maybe you have, like, when my Clyde Escape movie server tells my Crestron system that the, the end credits of the movie have reached, yeah. it tells, the Crestron system tells Ping, hey, run the lighting scene for the end credits, and then when I press stop on it or the, the end credits roll out, then it triggers a different lighting scene. So you can make them talk back and forth. All right. Well, that, that, that's certainly a nice scenario uh, to, uh, to have. Um, so it seems to me like for the average day, you know, the lights, the thermostat, and the window treatments, uh, and maybe even the alarm system, uh, uh, which, which also includes, I guess, uh, locking and unlocking your front door, you know, the locks that uh, – no, I don't know. Uh, are you using like standard lock systems? Are they quick set? You know, are you using your own? Uh, which lock systems do you work? Do you work with Z-Wave? I mean, what's what's out? I mean, there's so many things out there. What what does Crestron uh, use? Uh, so uh, so we work with Yale, who uh, makes a set of locks called Real Living. So there's a, a motorized deadbolt that you can get in either a touchscreen or a keypad. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a lever lock version of that. Um, and you can get it that still has a physical key or you can get it where there's no key at all, so there's nothing to pick. You have to know the code to get in. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Crestron provides a radio that is installed into that Yale lock when you, you, when you buy it. So you, you actually buy the lock from Crestron with that, that radio already installed in it, but that's what then enables it to talk with the rest of the Crestron products in the home. Okay. All right. Now, you know, again, speak just a little bit on because this is we 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 talked a little bit with uh, uh with our 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 guest uh, Mike Riley who was a uh, written a book on home automation and thing. I mean, the, the, today's industry, uh, it seems that a lot, there are a lot of things out there, but uh, you know, there's one of the enemies of home automation is standardization. Uh, one company's products won't work with another company's products and that type of thing. I mean, where does Crestron fit into that? Are, uh, do you feel that everybody's going to kind of come over to you or are you kind of reaching out and trying to find some way of working with other companies' products? I mean, you mentioned the Nest. Obviously, you, you seem to be moving in that direction, but what's Crestron's policy about, you know, let's say in the next five years or ten years, uh, how, uh, about, you know, working with other products that are out there and that are, that are, that are proving to be popular? Or are you going to stick strictly with Crestron? Um, so the most important thing is that whatever the customer is setting out to accomplish, they can do and have it all work together and and at the end of the day, you know, I want to make it so I unlock my door and that makes the lights turn on automatically, the music come on and the thermostat go to a certain set point. So the most straightforward way for us to do that without any finger that all those things came from Crestron. We wrote the software, we made the hardware, and if there's any problem, the guy in the cubicle next to the other cubicle says, <laughs> hey, fix that, and then it's fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll always try to make a complete solution, and uh, so that's you know we, we'll talk about integrating things by design. That's that's our preferred method, mm -hmm. um, but also it's important to to be able to interface because you know even with hundreds of engineers and research and development, and you know it's it's a, a pretty good sized company. There's also other people out there doing things, and it's you know you you want to be open and and in communication with all of them. Um, so that's you know why, for example, with Nest, we had a lot of customers you know say, hey, we want to have it talk to Nest, and so we should do that. We should make that possible as well. Mm. So it's it's what you're hearing from consumers are kind of driving the market as when you when you find a popular product like a Nest, for example, uh, you're going to try to work with it. Uh, if people already have you know, let's say there's some of these locks, I think Quickset makes them there. They work with Z-Wave or something. Uh, is it just you? You just have to wait until people say, "Hey, I want you to work with these." Uh, that uh, that you'll eventually, you think, come around to doing that. Um, so, in the case of a door lock, I think uh, it, we would need to think that we could. There'd have to be something better about that door lock. Um, okay. Because you know, most of the time, our systems are being in. They're being installed sort of as is one project as yours was, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, as as part of that project, you're going to buy some smart lock, and uh, we've got a good one that that people are happy with. So we're not going to put energy into making 17 different things that do the same thing when we can go right. do something that we haven't done at all yet. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I guess it all depends on what where, where you find yourself as a homeowner, what stage you're in, how much have you invested in technology to work, and then you say, you know, I really need to bring all this together. Uh, I know Apple is talking about that. They have their system. Uh, it seems that there's no governing body regulating all the different automation, home automation companies that are out there, and so I guess you just have to kind of uh, maybe, you know, if you can't find something that's controlling everything, you just may have to replace your locks, you know, the, the, or whatever it was to, to bring it all together. You know, I, I, guess it's just the, I guess that's just the way of the world. Uh, when you when you when you find products like that, so uh, and and home automation, I mean we're we're so on the cutting edge of home automation. I mean it's now finally becoming affordable uh, to everybody, and and with so many different little companies springing up making their individual products that they talk to anybody, uh, and then they're gone. You know, and, and next next year those companies are out of business, and then what do you do? So I, I guess it's basically you have to you have to use some common sense and and think it out carefully, and uh, make sure you're going with a company that has a reputable name and uh, it's been around for a long time and certainly Crestron certainly fills that bill and uh, I think that uh, uh, if you go that route you're not going to get burned or not get burned as badly. 
uh, stick with stick with the company that's been around and and and, and supports uh, the products that they make. Um, <clears throat> You know, we're we're almost at the end of the show, Tom. I just uh, had a, a, a another question for you uh, a, a, about this, and um, um, so let's let's say that uh, um, uh, let's talk about first of all. Let's talk a little bit about price. What is an average cost of a ping system to put into an average home? What Price range can someone expect to spend? Let's say they just want, you know, their lights controlled, and of course they can always add things later on. Or does Crestron have some sort of basic home automation package that uh, people can look into? How do you handle that? Um, so because every home is different, then of course you know every home automation system is different. I'm sure that all three of us have a different number of light switches in our house, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it basically becomes a function of what what devices you're replacing. Um, so uh, a Crestron dimmer is about two hundred dollars, and so you would uh, you would decide how many lights you were going to replace and and multiply that out. Mm -hmm. um, the window treatments are very custom because it depends what sh what fabric you pick. Sure. It depends all kind. You know, are there two rollers? Are that? But uh, a general rule of thumb is usually you know, by the time everything's said and done, it's about a thousand dollars to put a motorized shade on a window. Okay. Um, by the by, the time that, that things wrap up, um, if they're small windows, maybe it's a little low. <laughs> since big windows, maybe it's a little bit more, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, you, you know, from from then you're you're installing the app, and uh, there's a little hub that's uh, that you use as your the controller for the system, which is uh, six hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and talks to all those devices and makes it so that when your your phone's off, they still know what to do, and the keypad buttons are pressed, and things like that. So yeah, throwing out those numbers, it sounds to me like to put a good home automation system in an average home, you're going to spend about ten grand. It sounds to me. Would that, uh, would yeah, be, so that system that's in my home is at about would be about that price, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so expect to pay for about ten thousand dollars to add home automation to your system, to your home. Uh, the average uh, would be the average cost. Obviously, you can go you can go a lot more depending upon what you want to do. Uh, but you know, I mean, this is uh, this is this is about what you're looking at uh, the the feel that I'm getting here. So I think that's a good safe bet. Uh, <clears throat> now, again, do they, they they call an 800 number? Do they find a local restaurant dealer in the area? Uh, what do they do if they want if people want to do this? Um, so you can learn more at crestron.com slash home or specifically about about ping at crestron.com slash ping spelled with a Y. Mm -hmm. um, and from there then uh, you can either call us. There's a there's a number that you can call there to to talk with us to uh, to learn more, 88 Crestron. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can go as you're suggesting, uh, there's a dealer locator where you can find someone nearby who would have a showroom or be able to come out and consult with you in your home. Okay. Oh, they'll actually come out to your home and do a consultation, which is nice. Um, now again, if you uh, uh, if, for those of you listening to the show, if you you're in your car, whatever it is, and you didn't write that down, don't don't forget. Just go to our show notes page at computeramerica.com, and you'll see today's show, October the second, uh, and we actually have a link right there to the Crestron the website. It, it just uh, defi tells you what we're talking about tonight, and there's a link to the Crestron website at computeramerica.com on our show notes page. So uh, it's there for you to uh, uh, to access. Um, uh, Tom, okay, what's the next big thing in home automation? I mean, what's com what's coming? What's what's the next big thing? If you had to define it, what would you say? Uh, I think there's going to be a continued trend towards uh, you know being able to find a more personalized experience, uh, making it easier for people to to set up a sequence of events that really matches their lifestyle. Um, so, a lot of times, I think that. Uh, you know, when someone talks about a home automation system, that it's pretty easy for it to end up in practice really being more of a, a sort of a consolidation system. So I've taken all these different controls and switches and knobs and put them in one place. Mm -hmm. um, what's great about something like Ping is because I can myself set up all these events and say, when this happens, have this happen. When this happens, have this happen. Um, it's really changed my relationship with the system. So uh, I had a, a Crestron system in my home and I'm a Crestron programmer so I could even go do all the stuff myself mm -hmm. but you know it 
it took some time. So you'd have to say, oh, well, I'm going to go do some stuff now. Mm -hmm. And so in practice, you know, my wife would be like, hey, it would be cool if when you did this, that happened. I'd say, yeah, yeah, I'll do that on Saturday, and maybe, <laughs> I, would, maybe I wouldn't. Yeah. But now you grab the iPad and you just change it. And so the, the effect is that it's really it's much more tailored towards our lifestyle and the way we use our home yeah. Now, than it ever has been before. More user friendly. And the last thing about with lights, uh, you know, there are so many types of lights today. You know, it used to be incandescent lights, and that was it. And then they had halogen, and now, then you had compact fluorescent. And now you have LED, and you have so many categories within. The, are your complex fluorescents? Are they dimmable fluorescents? Are the LEDs now? Are they dimmable? And now, so, uh, are you as Crestron embracing the latest lighting technology? Because I know. You know, some of these things. You, if you had a dimmer, you couldn't put a dimmer on a dimmer. I mean, I mean, are you dealing with these newest technologies uh, with Crestron, with and these, these light, new lighting technologies? Yeah, these are they're all good questions that people have. So uh, when you've got any given light fixture, uh, there's normally a way to dim it. Sometimes you need to dim it in a different way electrically. So yes. instead of a forward phase dimmer, you need a reverse phase dimmer. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is try to figure that out. You know, one at a time as you go through your house. So we actually bring lighting fixtures into Crestron and test them mm -hmm. and then post a little report that our integrator would use. So they would walk through your house and figure out what fixtures you have or if it's a new house, they'll write down what all the ones are buying. Then that, that test report will tell you not only this light needs a forward phase dimmer, this one needs a reverse phase dimmer, mm -hmm. but you know this one actually can dim it from 8% to 92%. Mm -hmm. And if you go below eight, it'll start flickering. So yeah. then you tell our dimmer when you're setting it up, hey, go from eight to 92, and you get that nice, smooth, perfect curve that you're looking for, no flicker at the bottom. Okay. Now, and that you can do that with the ping, or is that some of the Crestron installer does? Uh, you, so you can set the range inside of ping. Uh, normally, uh, the, the best thing I think would be that when the person's putting the dimmer in, yeah. that they would do that then for you so that the homeowner didn't have to mess that up, but they could. Yeah, I remember I had a, a dimming switch that we put in, and, and, and then I changed all the bulbs to compact flash, not realizing it. And when it dimmed, it's they go flick, 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 you know, and uh, what is that? You know, some other electrical component which I hadn't anticipated. And it turns out that uh, the uh, dimmer that I had was older. It didn't. It, it, it came out before this lighting technology came out, so I had to buy a new one, uh, put that in, and, of course, then it, it could handle LED or compact flash. It just knew. You know, it could sense what kind of lights was with it. So, so uh, these lighting technology improves. You got to make sure that the technology that you're buying to control, or or the dimmer that you used to have, you know, that control the older incandescents, you know, might be uh, not up to date. And you're going to have to make sure that 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 the ones things that you're getting. And of course, as you just heard, Crestron, uh, make sure that their their equipment is compatible with the latest technology. That's really cool. Well, Tom, again, I want to thank you for being here with us on the show. Very enlightening. <laughs> and uh, again, uh, you can go to Crestron.com or you can go to our website at ComputerAmerica.com under our show notes page and you can check out the Crestron ping for yourself. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I think home automation is very cool. You should check it out. You should put it in. It's really neat. Tom, thanks so much for being with us here tonight. Thanks for the invite, Craig. I enjoyed it. All right. Take care. Have a good evening. And good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Bye-bye. All right, there you go, Crestron, uh, C-R-E-S-T-R-O-N. Uh, you can check it out for yourself at uh, ComputerAmerica.com. And, uh, and, and uh, again, your thermostat, your lighting, your shades, uh, it's all controllable remotely. You know? So before you, we, when you get to your home, you can just say, I'm home, and then all your lights will go to the right you know, brightness. And uh, it's just a very cool thing. They have these different, you can have different... Uh, you know, at nighttime and say good night, and then all these lights will dim and go off in the proper rooms. Maybe the night lights will stay on. You can configure all that. That's nice. It's part of home automation. In the chat room, they said we need Jarvis. Yeah, the Jarvis is what is what Iron Man is. He, oh yeah, yeah. It was no, no. Who, who am I thinking of in uh, Space Odyssey? Uh oh, Hal. Yeah, Hal. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Now Hal, yeah. Well, no, yeah. I'm more contemporary is Iron Man. Uh, he has Jarvis to control his home. Because he's got a nice home, and, that, and he's going to spend a little more than ten thousand dollars for to automate that kind of a house. You're telling me you wouldn't have a system put in your home that says, "I can't do that, Craig." <laughs> no, because I would just get frustrated and do it myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, Craig. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, home automation, I think, is one of those things that, you know, ten thousand dollars for an average home still sounds like a lot. 
But I think if you could roll that into when you're still building the house, you know, as like an upfront cost, yeah. new homes that are being built should probably start being built with home automation. I agree completely. Absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's the way to go. Hey, what's coming up? I know you picked some news stories for us. Uh, what do we got? Uh, um, I, I see playing Portal 2 improves your cognitive skills. What are some of the stories that you've got here? Uh, the playing Portal 2, it's not a plug for video games. I'll no. give you that right now. It's, I mean, video games are good, don't get me wrong, and you should play them as much as possible and as many as possible, but uh, the Portal 2 one isn't just about video games. Um, but there's also one where if you hate needles, I know a lot of people are not a fan of them, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually swallow something that will shoot you with needles from the inside. So, oh, you know, that's, that's good. Sounds that sounds um, like, yeah. what about it, this? It, what about this? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unpatchable malware that affects USB ports. Yeah, it sounds like there's a pretty, you know, a pretty basic level security that uh, USB is vulnerable to. Oh man, uh, we need Charles. Ten Do we need Charles Tendell for that now? Okay. Mm, I I think even he'd be susceptible to this. I mean, it sounds really low level, and the lower level you get, you know, the the harder it is to patch. So. Um, you know, there's also a new 3D printer that makes guns. Oh, well, that's old news, really. Good, good. No, 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 but this one is actually on sale, and it's sold out within 36 hours. Oh, my that's God. That's not new. No, that's not new. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's not old. That's not old. That, it, it, it's important. Um, and how about... Yeah, it, 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 there are lots of stories. Lots of good stories. Yeah, cops are handing out spyware to parents with z zero oversight. All these stories and more... Coming up in the uh, second hour of the Computer America Show, you're listening to us on the uh, Blog Talk Radio Network, the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. We're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello and welcome into Hour 2 of the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And uh, we just had Crestron on the show. Uh, really a very knowledgeable uh, gentleman who uh, was talking about it. You heard he's, he's, a, he's a programmer. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for home automation systems, I mean, Crestron's been around for, for many, many years. Uh, highly recommend them. Uh, I actually, we use a Crestron system in our home. Um, so, there you go. I mean, you know, uh, you can listen to any archive show, again, as well, at ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, just, uh, just head over to the Blog Talk Radio site. Uh, or actually, just go to our archives, pull-down menu right at the top of ComputerAmerica.com and all the ways to listen to the archive shows that we have. The link to iTunes, uh, which, which carries the show. You can uh, listen to it again uh, on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, we archive the, and also we have our video page because we have our live Computer America video streaming page now brought to you by Other World Computing. You can, uh, re you can s watch them there. All of the archives are available at one point right there under our archives page at the Computer America website. So there it is. So Ben, we're in <laughs> to hour two. Uh, anything else before we uh, before we start doing news stories? Uh, no, no, I think we're good to go. All right, well let's do it. Tonight's computer and technology news is brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. You can visit them at slimwareutilities.com to clean, speed up, and optimize your Windows system for free. Let that sink in, people, for free. Everything at the Slimware Utilities website is completely free. And I'm not talking, you know, a freemium model that, you know, you have it for 10 days and then you have to buy, buy the, you know, unlock it or, or you get a crippled version. Uh, none of that. Everything at Slimware Utilities website is completely free, fully functional. Okay, 
You don't have to pay for it. Uh, it will truly, I mean, download all of them uh, from their rec image backup software uh, to all the slimmer utilities. Back them, uh, download them all, keep them on your computer. Run them. You should run them on a regular basis. The, the, they have scheduling, but if you don't, you know, at least have them in your toolbox so if you do come against a problem, you can use them to help correct it. Um, so you'll have it. So download all of them. You know, you'll 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 really be glad that you did that, and you'll thank us for it. It's slimwareutilities.com. Peace of mind for your computer. All right, Ben. Well, I'm going to let you start this off. Our new okay. search. We have so many. Why don't you uh, pick something that uh, that we can talk about? Mm, that we can talk about. That's a different one. Um. <laughs> all right. Uh, how about this one's kind of weird. Uh, Craig, have you ever seen Adam Sandler? Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm sorry. I, I'm not a huge fan of Adam Sandler. I realize he makes some very funny movies, but he's had some movies that I just, I just don't find appealing. I um, don't, I don't think you're alone in that feeling. And uh, I think for like he, I think he really hit his high mark with with people. Like, like he had the people really rooting for him. I think the last one was you know Happy Gilmore. Uh, maybe yeah. you could include Fifty First Dates. And you know the water boy, yeah. some well, of those. The remote control was it the the uh, the click. remote click? Yeah, yeah, that wasn't too bad. Click was like the beginning of the end. Yeah, he. I mean, he did some movies that were such poor taste that I can't begin to tell you. I mean, <laughs> but well, well, I mean, he was never meant to be. You know, the the highbrow humor that you know. Mm. He, he he was never the next Mel Brooks, you know. No, 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 no. you can't say that. I mean, I understand that there's, you know, the humor can be, but I mean, this he makes he he makes Beavis and Butthead look like angels. I mean, sometimes he'll do some stuff that is just just so terrible. You're not the target audience. I mean, Little Nicky. Have you ever seen it? What is it? Little Nicky. No, I have not. Where his dad's oh, yeah, where his dad is the devil and his mom is the angel. Yeah, I, 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 I agonized through that one. Yes, I will. I love that movie. Okay. <laughs> di di different, different people are, you know, like Am Sandler. Was, well, but that was, so, that was didn't have the bad taste. What was the one where he pay, he played the uh, he played the uh, Israeli uh, spy? You know, where he. Uh, oh, oh, what was that? That was uh, yeah, yeah. no, no. That, uh, there were some scenes in there that were just horrible. Zohan, I, uh, don't 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 mess with the Zohan. Yeah, there was a, there were some scenes there that were just horrible, and I am sorry. I mean, I, I, that I, was part of the downturn. The, yeah. that, that that was not his high point. No. But you know, we have an article here from Max and PC, and Netflix apparently is very much of a different mind than all of us, and sees okay. a gem in Adam Sandler. A gem. So Adam Look. Sandler goes goes streaming for laughs. Netflix on Thursday today announced a deal that will see the release of a four full-length feature films starring comedian and actor Adam Sandler exclusively through the streaming service. Sandler's Happy Madison Productions will work with Netflix to develop each of the four films, so you can probably expect a similar style of humor as past Sandler movies and mm -hmm. perhaps a continuation of the usual cameos. Sandler has grossed more than $3 billion globally in the box office, but more importantly for Netflix's decision to do a deal like this is that his films consistently rank among viewed on Netflix members in the U.S. and across its global territories from Brazil to the U.K. My, my, my opinion of Netflix subscribers just dropped <laughs> a level oh. before, uh, hearing that information. I'm sorry. You know, it... it, it yeah. But Netflix is such an all-you-can-eat buffet mentality. I mean, sure, you probably wouldn't have that questionable meat that is either pork or chicken, and you can't really decide which. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't have that for dinner every night. But when you go to the, you know, but when you go to the buffet, hey, it's fair game. It, it's what you want without being judged. Yeah. So, so, and Adam Sandler is great for not being judged. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the 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 stand-up comedian turned actor has appeared in numerous films such as Happy Gilmore. Great, Billy Madison loved it. The Wedding Singer, yeah. that was more of a rom com. Yeah, probably more up your alley. Mm -hmm. uh, Punch Drunk Love, not a fan. The Water Boy loved it. Mm -hmm. The Longest Yard, pretty good yeah. actually. Uh, Fifty First Dates, that was good. That was yep. good. Mm -hmm. And Grown Ups One and Two, not a fan. And more. Uh, so, quote, when these fine people came to me uh, with an offer to make four movies for them, I immediately said yes for one reason and one reason only. Netflix rhymes 
wet chicks. Weird. <laughs> Let the streaming begin. Oh, um, so uh, Sandler obviously showing his uh, strong, strong comedic uh-huh. ability right off the gate. Uh, other than being on the hook for four movies in collaboration with Happy Madison Productions, other terms of the deal were not disclosed. Traditional studios typically paid Sandler $20 million per movie, along with a percentage of the film. For his role in anger management, Sandler earned $25 million plus 25% of the gross, which is around $150 million, giving him an $37.5 million on Celebrity Net Worth. And say what, say what you want about Adam Sandler. He consistently makes money. Yeah, I, I'm not denying it, but I'm saying he's making money on 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 the poor taste of of of, of movie viewers. I mean, I just, I, as I said, some of the movies he mentioned that yeah, were good, but there's some just awful scenes. I mean, just horrific scenes that he in some of his movies that are just, I, you know, I, 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 I was speechless. I, I talk for a living, and I'm speechless seeing some of these things that that happens. It's. Uh, yeah, it, it it's not, you know, it, it. I'm sorry, it is public opinion to kind of say that Adam Sandler is, you know, he is very good in a certain kind of role, mm-hmm. and he's been really doing, uh, Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler have been doing movies left, right, and center like crazy, yeah. and he has come out and actually said, you know, in plain English, listen, we're just doing this for the paycheck. It's, it, it's nothing more, nothing less. People will come see me. You know, and, and I know they're rehashes, they're old, they're cliche, but people will see it, and I like money. So, you know, he he's come out and said that in in, in interviews. I, I don't fault him for that. I mean, that's fine. I mean, we all have to make our way and 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 making a living. You know, that's I perfectly I can understand that. You know, it just just some of those movies seem to so bad. <laughs> smells it smells selling out, but you know if he gets back to you know the 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 Billy Madison and the ha- and the Happy Gilmore, yeah. and, you know the the Water Boy, you know well yeah you know, actually he might be a little bit, getting a little bit old for that kind of slapstick humor, but you think he might ever do serious a uh, serious film? Or I think he it? has, and I think it flopped. I remember him doing one where he was like a lawyer or something like that. And you know, it got a lot of attention because he was in a in a serious role. What, what but, was it? Oh, I remember he did one where he was um uh, he was he was living on the streets of New York, and uh, he and people thought he was kind of deranged, but actually he was quite wealthy. Um, and it was a serious role. I remember, and and he befriends uh uh, uh what's that what's that uh, you know he play he, the actor he's uh uh Don Don what is it um. Oh, he, uh-huh. You know, he's an Iron Man three. You know, the uh, uh, the he he plays the uh, uh, the other the Iron Man. You know, the uh, hmm. Patri- oh oh, Patri- oh yeah, yeah yeah Don um, Cheadle Don Cheadle you know Don Cheadle there you go Don Cheadle he's with him uh, he he co-starred with him in this movie and it was a very it, evidently he had a he had a, a sickness that was affecting him. And uh, Don Cheadle kind of befriends him, and uh, th- there was no humor in that. All that was a pretty good movie, actually, as I recall. Yeah, so. uh, he he has done some serious roles. I highly, highly doubt that Netflix signed him up for four movie deals, and uh, that are going to be serious. They're probably all going to be you know slapstick comedy or rom coms or something like that. Um, but it's it's good that Netflix knows their audience. I mean, they obviously do. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, because they are not, you know, they're not looking for that high impact, you know, first weekend selling. Mm-hmm. You know, these are going to be exclusive on Netflix. That that gives him a little bit more um, freedom mm-hmm. to, you know, kind of get back to what what he's known for instead of just doing what sells. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. But uh, yeah. you know, either way, he signed four movie deals, expecting coming out in, in the next couple of years. Um, and if you want to see them, you're going to have to really scrounge up your meager earnings and try to spring for that Netflix subscription because I know it's really hard to get one of those. Yeah, exactly. Eight, eight nine bucks a month or something. Uh, the reason is Netflix rhymes with wet chicks, please. <laughs> okay. So that's actually- Listen, they, 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 they all can't be winners. No, but that was, that's kind of funny. All right. Well, we'll see. Okay. Um. Worst case scenario, I mean, have you seen some of the B-rated movies on Netflix? That's actually one of my favorite pastimes is to go onto Netflix and look at some of the otter yeah, there movies. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of oh them. Oh, my God. Some of them are hilarious. 
Some of, yeah, some of them are downright awful. I mean, just poorly. Oh, the, the, some yeah. of them are so awful they're funny, but some of them are actually pretty good. The, I have seen some. Uh, they're hard to find though. You have to get there. And then also, I wish Netflix would come up with a category called subtitled, because they have something that looks great, and it's subtitled. And 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 then you sit there reading the movie. I wish they would. I would wish they would put it in a separate category, so you know that these movies, the, uh, their foreign films or whatever, that they, they're subtitled. They haven't done that. I don't know why. You know, it, it's weird. The other day, you know, I'm I'm trying to learn German in my spare time, and I was cert and I was trying to search Netflix for movies that only played in German. You know, maybe German uh, television show, German yeah. movie, German what have you. Yeah. And I tried looking up or you know, finding a way that you can just look up, you know. Movies and things on Netflix that are in German, yeah, and it's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible to look by language. You can't look by language. You can't look by uh, whether it's subtitled. Uh, you, they they don't have those. And you would think that was such an obvious category, but they don't. And, and so they do have a category called foreign films. So yeah. I guess if it falls under that, you'd probably be looking at you know subtitles. But, but that's but the closest you get. Yeah, but they take those foreign films and they intersperse them with all the other. Yeah, movies. you know, if it intersects drama, comedy, horror, it you know everywhere. You, yeah, you, yeah. And and then you say, oh, this looks interesting. You start watching, and it's subtitled. Like, oh man, you know. So so there's a lot of there's a lot of that. There's a lot of junk out there too. You know, and I guess it had to. You say, you say junk, but I mean, you know, the the the, the B rated com uh, comedy <laughs> horror genre like, like with zombies. <laughs> they're not even C rated. They're D rated. You know. There is one uh, called Iron Sky. Uh, have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I've seen it. I watched it. It wasn't bad. It, it wasn't bad. It's about was... Nazis living on the moon. Nazis living on the moon. Yeah, I know. And they come back and invade Earth. Yeah, I know. I saw it. It it's was pretty good. good. But it was I, you know, there. There are these hidden gems in there that are completely it was worth watching. It was well produced. It was. It was. It was a well produced movie. Believe it or not, they had a couple of name actors. Um, What's his uh, was what was his name played one of the uh, the oh I I can't tell you a single name of one of the actors I I I just know I had fond memories of it yeah there was a, there was a <laughs> okay anyway so they are out there you just have to weed through them folks you know and and find the movies that you like don't just look for your Adam Sandler's and your you know your 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 five star movies you know your no. James Bond your Adam Sandler your what have you there are good little movies and hopefully Netflix has a way of you know. Giving you not just the AAA movies, but also some of the different stuff, mm -hmm. and Netflix getting into movies because again, this is on the heels of them, you know, saying that they are producing mm -hmm. the uh, sequel to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yep, mm -hmm. that's so. True. You know, th th this is them really pushing, you know, really making a push, showing that they are very serious, or at least you know, however serious Adam Sandler can get mm -hmm. into making movies. All right, all right. Okay, um, I'd like to move on to another story here. Go for uh, it. This from Wired magazine. The unpatchable malware that infects USBs is now on the loose, according to today's story by Andy Greenberg. Uh, it's been just two months since uh, researcher Karsten Knoll demonstrated an attack he called bad USB to a standing room only crowd at the Black Hat Security Conference in Vegas showing that it's possible to corrupt any USB device with insidious undetectable malware. Well, hey, you know, <laughs> if you're going to talk about it, uh, given the severity of that security problem and the lack of an easy patch, Noel has held back on releasing the code he used to pull off the attack. But at least two of Knoll's fellow researchers aren't waiting any longer. See, this is the problem, you know. Uh, you know, you, it, you put it out in the wild, and you, once you open Pandora's box, you cannot close it again. And that's basically what's happening here. Because um, he's talking about it. And a talk at the DerbyCon Hacker Conference in Louisville, Kentucky last week, researchers Adam Caudill and Brandon Wilson showed that they've reversed engineered the same USB firmware as Knoll's SR Labs, reproducing some of Knoll's bad USB tricks. And unlike Knoll, the hacker pair has also published the code for those attacks on GitHub, <laughs> raising the stakes for USB makers to either fix the problem 
or leave hundreds of millions of users vulnerable. There you go. You know, they, they don't care about the, the, the they want to say we did it first. We they just want to they want to get it out there, you know, and there and there it is. But that's good because it's it's kind of the same way with uh, scientific research and viruses. It's like, you know, do you really want to show you know, your scientific research that said, you know, I just combined Ebola with the common flu, and it just made it a thousand times more, you know, dangerous because now if someone sneezes on you, you now have Ebola. Okay. It's, and, 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 you know, and you're thinking, wow, that's something that no one should know about that. That should be buried in someone's password-protected hard drive, which is in the bottom of the ocean in a lockbox <laughs> that's strapped to sharks. Yeah. I mean, that is something that no one should ever know about. Yeah. But that's not the way that you know security is happening nowadays with information. Everybody you don't wants want to publish it. Everybody wants to get it up. They want to be first. They want to publish it. Not only that, but, but, but that's also a good thing because you don't want to hide the information and hope someone doesn't stumble, o stumble over it. You want it to be as public as possible so that people can start working on solutions to it. Yeah. Well, let's continue on with this because I don't know if there is a solution to it. I guess there may be, but I guess they're certainly going to have to try now. Yeah. Uh, uh, the belief we have is that all of this should be public. This is a quote from, from them, from Cotto, okay? Uh, it shouldn't be held back. Sounds like Ben. So so we're releasing it. We're releasing everything we've got, uh, Cotto told uh, the DerbyCom audience on, uh, on Friday. He said, he said, this was largely inspired by the fact that SR Labs didn't release their material. So we're going to do it, right? If you're going to prove that there's a flaw, you need to release the material so people can defend against it. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, the two independent security researchers who declined to name their employer, <laughs> I can see why. Mr. Bond. Yes. Say that public publicly releasing the USB attack code will allow penetration testers to use their technique all the better to prove their clients to their clients that USBs are nearly impossible to secure in their current form. And they also argue that making a working exploit available is the only way to pressure USB makers to change the tiny device's fundamentally broken security scheme. You know, there are how many untold hundreds of billions of USB devices out there? Yeah, how are they supposed to fix all of that, you know, it's just it's just insurmountable, I I think. But I okay. Mean, okay, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. There are let's say, you know, five billion cars, mm -hmm. and there's this there's this thing where if you accidentally hit a pothole, and you happen to nick the bottom of the gas tank, which is installed on the bottom, it tends to blow up like catastrophically, like boom. Okay. Now, do you say there's too many cars? You know, yes, it's a problem, but I mean, it 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 would be too hard to fix. Or do you kind of say what the problem is, and then you get going? You can't say a problem is too big to fix when it is a problem, especially well, I mean, with technology. You've taken a life-threatening situation and compared it to a data-threatening situation, so that's not quite the same thing. But I understand your point. I I mean, I certainly get your point. So some people's data security is their life. I mean, if oh. if, if everything you were stolen because of a stupid USB, well, you'd be... Well, this guy sounds like you because his next quote is saying exactly what you said. He says, he says this is Cottle again speaking, telling Wired. He says, he says if this is going to get fixed, it needs to be more than just a talk at Black Hat. Okay? Uh, he argues that the USB trick was likely already available to highly resourced government intelligence agencies like the NSA, who may already be using it in secret. Okay. He says, if the only people who can do this are those with significant budgets, the manufacturers will never do anything, he says. You have to prove to the world that it's practical and that anyone can do it. That puts pressure on the manufacturers to fix the real issue. What is the real issue? Well, is it something that's easily fixable? I don't think so. It, he says that it's not. Uh, <clears throat> maybe to more modern computers, but a lot of the computers that are already installed that are running in the internet and the servers and the background, you know, they're using USB to communicate with, the, you know, 
it's it's a it's a can of worms. I don't think that, that you can blanket with a fix like that. Uh, well, like Noel, Cottle and Wilson reverse engineered the firmware of USB microcontrollers sold by the Taiwanese firm Vizon, one of the world's top USB makers. They then reprogrammed that firmware to perform d disturbing attacks. In one case, they showed that the infected, U infected USB can impersonate a keyboard to type any keystrokes the attacker chooses on the victim's machine. Okay. Because it affects the firmware of the USB's microcontroller, that attack program would be stored in the rewritable code that controls the USB's basic functions, not in its flash memory. Uh, even deleting the entire contents of its storage wouldn't catch the malware. Other firmware tricks demonstrated by Caudill and Wilson would hide files in that invisible portion of the code or silently disable a USB security feature that password protects a certain portion of its memory. People look at these things and see them as nothing more than storage devices, says Caudill. They don't realize there's a reprogrammable Pre-programmable, reprogrammable computer in their hands. Uh, in an earlier interview with Wired ahead of his Black Hat talk, Berlin-based Noel had said that he wouldn't release the exp exploit code he developed because he considered the bad USB vulnerability practically unpatchable. He did, however, offer a proof of concept for devices to prevent USB devices firmware from being rewritten. Uh, their security architecture would need to be fundamentally redesigned, he argued, so that no code could be changed on the device without the unforgeable signature of the manufacturer. But he warned that even if that code signing measure were put into place today, it could take 10 years or more to iron out the USB standards bugs and pull existing vulnerable devices out of circulation. Basically, he says, for the most part, this is unfixable, and he said at the time. He says, but before even starting this arms race, USB sticks have to attempt security at minimum. So, you know, I understand what you're saying, Ben, but you, he's saying this thing is so so unfixable, so so bad that nothing really good can come out of it. Letting people know that it can be done because it's, it's unfixable, uh, you know, I don't see what good this is going to do. Caudill says that by publishing their code, he and Wilson are hoping to start that security process. But even they hesitate to release every possible attack against USB devices. They're working on another exploit that would invisibly inject malware into files as they are copied from a USB device to a computer. Great. Uh, by hiding another USB infecting function in that malware, Caudill says it will be possible to quickly spread the malicious code from any USB stick that's connected to a PC and back to any new USB plugged into the infected computer. That two-way infection trick could potentially enable a USB-carried malware e epidemic. Caudill considers that attack so dangerous that even he and Wilson are still debating whether to release it. Uh, you know. Okay, so I guess for everyone out there who you know kind of is kind of brushing this this one off, it sounds like it's pretty close to AIDS for computers. Pretty much, yeah, it's like that. I He's mean, once it's infected, it can not only infect you know infect the the, uh, the operating system with malware, but it also infects the port at which you know you plug it in. So. You know, even though you may get the you know the the uh, operating system clean, if you plug in another USB stick, then that USB stick can be infected, yeah. transfer somewhere else, and it just keeps going and going and going. Yeah, that's so, some pretty interesting research that, that 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 they're getting into though. That that they found that and were able to do that. You know, sleepy in the chat rooms. It looks like a new user. He says, "Is the moral of the story to avoid the internet?" I don't know, sleepy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You know, I haven't plugged the internet into my USB lately, but it uh, hasn't really been an issue. The, I think the moral of the story is if you don't want to be infected by this particular thing, uh, don't let random people stick their USBs in your computer. Yeah, but it might not be a random be It might be a friend, a good friend of yours who doesn't know that his USB stick is infected. It, it might be a good buddy of yours. Hey, I want to make a copy of this, and he sticks it in, and you're done. You're toast. <laughs> 
Although, you know, we could possibly say that the USB is on its way out. Well, we have it, USB. It could 3. be old technology. Well, we have USB 3.0, and uh, I don't know if this affects 3. It, it affects USB 2.0, but I don't know if it affects uh, or 1.1, which is really pretty much obsolete. But um, does it affect USB 3? The article doesn't say that. It doesn't go. To, it doesn't. It, it says it's a basic function of you know just how USB is made. So, so I'm guessing somewhere in the firmware, yeah. you know, it, it, it'd be pretty basic. Um, so it, it would affect you know one, two, and three. You know, again, Caudill and Wilson both say they finished this article by saying, uh, quoting, he says, there's a tough balance between proving that it's possible and making it easy for people to actually do it. He says, there's an ethical dilemma there. He says, we want to make sure we're on the right side of it. Well, releasing it to the public, I don't think is on the right side. I, really I think it's completely the right side. That lets people, you know, get the heads up. That's not letting them encounter in the wild without any, you know, warning. Now everyone knows what it is, and they can check for it. Especially people who have to do, you know, uh, uh, stress tests and things like that, uh, penetration tests, like Charles Sandel does. They know that this is one possible tool that the hacker could use to get in there. It. The more people know about it, the more you know, the, the more aware of what can happen, the better off they are. Yeah. Keep, keeping yeah. it hidden d doesn't help anyone. J just because you bury your head in the sand doesn't mean things aren't going on. No, I'm not for burying my head in the sand, but I'm just saying don't, you know, I mean, it's it's like anything else. I mean, should we it's let... The, should well, we... Like I said, you know, manufacturing of viruses. I mean, I mean, just because, you know, telling people about it isn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, uh, I don't know. I just, I'm all for dissemination of, uh, of, of knowledge, so that's good. I, I say, hooray for them. <laughs> all right, you listen to the Computer America Show on the Blog Talk Radio Network, on the Boost Radio Network, and the IRN Radio Network. We're doing computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities. we got lots more. Stay with us. This is a special alert to all Americans. A vehicle with less than 120,000 miles with an auto warranty about to expire or no warranty coverage at all. Due to a decline in the economy and major car companies, Care has announced revolutionary, inexpensive mechanical breakdown coverage that is now available to the general public to save consumers thousands on auto repairs. An open phone line has been established for drivers to call who own a vehicle that is less than 10 years old for a free five-minute quote and to see if you qualify. The number is 800-483-2514. Drivers who are covered with this auto protection will not have to pay for a covered repair again. This is the auto coverage now sweeping across America at a fraction of what dealerships charge and is public by calling today. The number to call is 800-483-2514. 800-483-2514. That's 800-483-2514. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-866-663-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. So, disable the cable and get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-866-663-MYTV right now to sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and up to four rooms. And there's no equipment to buy. That includes your free HDTV upgrade, your free DVR upgrade, and your free professional installation. And the best part, the pristine digital picture and sound. Call 1-866-663-MYTV. So, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1 866 663 MyTV. 1 866 663 MyTV. Disable the cable, cut costs, and get more. Call 1 866 663 MyTV. 1 866 663 MyTV. Hello, this is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, the Waterfall Audio Serio, that's S-E-R-I-O. Well, for anybody who follows our reviews of quality audio gear, and for everybody else who cares, our criterion is easy to say and hard to accomplish. Acoustic transparency. Mm -hmm. By that, we mean that nothing should color or weight or distort or hamper every detail and every nuance you might hear if you are in the studio live as the recording is made. 
More audio transparency often, but not always, means a higher sticker price. It's also a claim you should never believe from a seller, and depending on how refined your own audio tastes are, or may not be, all of this may or may not make a difference. All of that is a lead up to our review of the Waterfall Audio Serio, an amazingly good small with the design that looks more like a decor piece than a sound enthusiast. Nice looking. It's a 5 inch by 5 inch glass frame surrounding a hefty 3 inch audio driver in an aluminum housing that makes the whole small package 3.5 inches thick. The specs, 150 watts peak, but 30 to 80 watts is their sweet spot. 87 decibel sensitivity, so good detail and a response range of 180 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So they benefit from teaming with woofers, and we can confirm these are consistent with what we hear. These specs are consistent with what we hear. Now, when we were discussing LED emitters, we mentioned a and then talking about the focal point of the LED and flashlights where bigger emitters put out more light that's out of focus. The relatively small size of these speakers, the stereo, similarly benefit sound imaging, especially noticeable for stereo or surround sound. Stereo is nimble enough to respond quickly on percussion, and strings are crisp and not the least bit money. They're wonderful at bringing out the detail within the audio. One warning, the price tag is right up there with the sound quality yeah. and, in our opinion, worth it if you're willing to spend it. Bottom line, the Waterfall Audio Serio is a small wonder in speakers for both the ears and the eyes. This is Marty Winston with a News Tips Bullet Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America show. Uh, 34 minutes past the hour. $55,000. I know, you bring it up every time. I'm sure you're going to bring it up tomorrow night, too. After oh, it's expensive. Wow. Hey, yeah, you you know some people some people like cars some people are audiophiles. What you gonna do? Um, if you don't like it, I hear that Walmart will sell you some fifteen dollars speakers <laughs> that are probably right up your alley. So you know, uh, okay. options, 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 options. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're doing computer and technology news, and uh, this next story from X and PC again, and I actually saw this one originally on Popular Science. Didn't get around to it because it came out during the weekend, but this is one for everyone who, I'm sure if you've watched TV and you watch one of the uh, one of the channels that the demographic skews slightly older, you know, so think the news, think uh, Discovery, what have you. Um, not my words, it's just who they target, and, you know, and they have Nielsen ratings to back that up. But they have commercials on for a website called Lu uh, Lumosity. Lumosity? Lumosity. And it's, uh, and it's, at least in the commercials, it's a website that you go to, and it has, quote-unquote, brain training games. Because, you know, they're like, you can go to the gym, you can train your body, but there's nothing to really train your mind. And it helps you with, like, you know, with the science of neuroplasticity and things like that, helping you improve your cognitive skills. Well, let's go to something else, something that I am in intimately familiar with, and that's Portal 2 and video games. So, you know, the study is playing Portal 2 is actually better than Lumosity. So most of the time when you hear about video games in the news, it's uh, some bonehead politician trying to win votes by condemning virtual violence while trying to make a connection to real-world crimes. Silly. Uh, we know that's bunk, but on the flip side, are there positive be benefits to playing games? And the answer is yes. A new study shows that playing Portal 2 might actually be better than Lumosity at improving cognitive skill sets. And, and again, you know, just in case you're not familiar with it, Lumosity is a, hu is a human cognition project consisting of scientifically designed games intended to work out your brain and improve cognitive function. It works, but maybe not as well as Portal 2, according to the study that, that compared the two titles. 
The study focused on 77 undergraduates who were randomly assigned to play either Portal 2 or Lumosity for 8 hours. Before playing their assigned game, they each took a set of online tests related to problem solving, spatial skills, and persistence. Results revealed that participants who, participants who, who were assigned to play Portal 2 showed a statistically significant advantage over Lumosity on each of the three com composite measures. Uh, Portal 2 players also showed significant increases from pre-test to, po to post-test on specific small and large-scale spatial tests, while those with Lumosity condition did not show any pre-test to post-test differences on any measure. Mm -hmm. uh, Val Shute, one of the study's three researchers, put it in plain English to the Wall Street Journal, Portal 2 kicks Lumosity's butt. <laughs> uh, this study alone isn't extensive enough to to definitely say that Portal 2 is better for the brain than Lumosity, but the results also can't be ignored. Uh, the Wall Street Journal spoke with Sean Green, a psychologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who studies video games, uh, but wasn't in on this particular study, who brought up an, an interesting point. If, entertain if entertainment games actually do a better job than de games designed for neuroplasticity, what that suggests is that we are clearly missing something important about neuroplasticity, which I think is the main thrust of this whole thing. If a video game meant to you know, be a puzzle solver, be enjoyable, be fun, engage, and have, you know, and have the user be entertained is better at all of these areas that are meant to work out the brain than games that are, you know, from the ground up designed to improve your cognitive abilities. That means that there there's a split there and you know that 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 the people who are designing these games that are meant just to you know help improve the brain they're missing something they're missing something in that you know they can they can get better results from something that is not targeted towards their audience and yet they're doing a worse job at it hmm. so it, it's and and Craig I, I guess my question to you is you know we're not saying here that all video games are great and you know video game video games are better than you know any other kind of you know reading or what have you, but what do you think about you know games as a helping or, or, um, ga games as a tool to be used to help you know increase brain activity? Uh, I think that's a given. I think I mean uh, a lot of research has been done about it, and uh, and these and 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 games. Uh, I, I, they didn't start out really as games. I think you know they they fact you know they've just found that you know these mental exercises. You know, that it, that was with Lumosity. They they took you know scientists who were experts in, or, or, you know, quote unquote experts in the field, and they you know made simple to use easy games right. that would quote unquote improve neuroplasticity. But there's it's, but as, as this guy says. Uh, if if playing Portal 2 is 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 better than that, then you know we really need to we, we're missing something important about neuroplasticity, uh, and and he has a point because now now what is it specifically about Portal 2, uh, that game that's making it uh, so you know such a wonderful exercise for your mind? Is it, it cause Portal it's Portal and Portal 2? Yeah, they have very easy to grasp but very complex uh, tools. To solve puzzles, it's a puzzle-solving game, which is different than than usual. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's not a first-person shooter. I mean, it takes the point of view of a first-person shooter, but I mean, it's it it makes you have to think in ways that you normally don't. Yes, and and and, and I've seen I played a little bit of Portal, so I understand what it is, and it's it's a very intriguing game, and I can understand that. I mean, I. Uh, even games, anything that challenges your mind, that makes your mind work to think. I mean, I remember playing Mist, you know, which was which was a huge. We success. need to update your games because you keep <laughs> referencing these ten-year-old games. No, but still, I, I remember that it was one that I played to the very end because it was so. You had a series of puzzles and things that you had to kind of figure out, and and, and it made you think. Uh, uh, in ways that you didn't normally, you know, reason, and and the solutions were just, you know. Kind of off the wall, and, and I realize these are all precursors to you know the, the more modern games like Portal and Portal 2. But but again, uh, it's been proven scientifically that people who enjoy and and uh, puzzle solving, you know, and, and playing games like that, 
really uh, in the long run uh, turn out to you know be more. Um, uh, I think the results are on the level of a reader versus a non-reader in terms of like memory and things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, memory is part of the, uh, one of the many tools that we we have, and 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 by using it, you don't lose it. It's like an, it's like any other muscle. I think is the analogy. If you play memory games, you know, and, and they don't have to be complex. You know, I have this little game on my iPhone. You know, where, where it's like uh, you know, where, where you have a four squares and. Uh, what was it called? You know, and it plays the tone, and then you play the Simon. Second. Simon, yeah, but it's it's on my iPhone. It's it's a, 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 a but it's a version of si Simon, I, and and I found that the more I played it, I found that I could remember longer sequences that I could when I initially played it. You know, uh, it does improve your memory, and 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 by stretching your mind in those ways, um, they're they're making claims that not only it makes you better, it, it can stave off things like Alzheimer's. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of research today that suggests that uh, people who play games or, or puzzles or mind challenging or using their mind uh, can stave off uh, these afflictions. Uh, they can actually uh, reverse, not, not reverse them. In other words, is, you know, just not get them. You know? Yeah, yeah, so stave them off. And you know, it's, and I think Portal Two really does, you know, come into the limelight here because it is such a different, engaging, fun game. Y you know, forget being, you know. 65 years old, 70 years old, and you're trying to stave off the effects of, of old age on your brain. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this thing engages 14 year olds, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds. It is. It, it's, it's a game that engages everyone. Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, basically, you're making a hole in the wall, and 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 the way you put it, you think. Know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Think black hole, you know, from the cartoons where you know the cartoon characters they throw the hole up on the wall and then they run through it and they and they come out the other side. Yeah, that's Portal. Yeah, exactly. But you don't mess them out the other side. You might come out in a different, totally different area, you know. And and they're somehow connected. And and and. Uh, well, of course, you shoot two portals. So like you make an opening and an exit, and then you know the the force carries you and everything like that. So you know if you're if you jump from a high height and you're moving really fast, you're gonna shoot out the exit hole at a much greater speed, which lets you you know solve puzzles and things like that. It's just you know it makes you think in a way that most would, games don't. Yeah, exactly, and and I'm very much for that. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's it's a it really does uh, uh, sharpen the mind. Now, I think you know, and, and again, not a scientist. I suck at science. So don't 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 worry about that. <laughs> but I very much do, and I think one of the things that you know leads Portal Two to be better than Lumosity, you know, in, in all these regards. I have to think it has something to, to do with engagement, because it's you know these small games that claim to you know claim to improve your cognition and things like that. I think people approach the, these kind of mini games as as an exercise. You know, I, I played this for four minutes and then I'm done and then I can go on with my life. Whereas Portal Two, you know, you you make time, you make a couple hours, and you're engaged. You're you're trying to figure out you know what do you hear, what do you hear. You actually choose you know in your spare time to do this. It's it's not an exercise. It's not you know something that you're doing. It's it's not it's not like eating a carrot. Mm -hmm. It's something that you enjoy doing. Yeah. So uh, so so I have to think that there's a level of engagement there that you know the brain is recept is more receptive to it than if you were just putting it through through its paces. Right. I mean I mean if if you if the experience is an enjoyable one, then all then you're going to do it. More, in other words, because it's it's now it's not a laborious process. Oh, oh I've got to do this. I mean, you're ha you're being entertained by playing the game because we're calling it a quote unquote game. That means it's supposed to be fun. And if you if that experience is an enjoyable one, something you look forward to, and you know, might even be thinking uh, through the day, and you know, when you're not even playing it, and looking forward or anticipation of getting back in front of the computer and playing it. I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, that then then you're then, then you found something. Uh, I mean, it's like it's like food. You know, you can eat something that you don't enjoy, or you you can sit down to a really good meal, and you're looking forward to it in anticipation. Uh, I, I think I think anything that you do that is a pleasurable experience is going to encourage you to do it more. And well, I think the you know the the whole thing with pleasure is it is it releases dopamine, what have you, you know, whatever that chemical is. Um, yeah, that. 
you actually enjoy it, and you're going, and the body says, "Okay, we're doing something good. Let's release, you know, let's release the the, the feel good drug." Mm -hmm. That's you know, that's the point of something that feels good. Yeah, exactly. And 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 you're feeling good about it. You're enjoying it, and at the same time, it's good for you. You know, because it's obviously uh, making you uh, use your mind, and uh, and you're obviously increasing. Uh, uh, the the again with that game assignment, it's very simple. But you know, I, I found myself when I first played it, I you know sequences, and then after doing it for about a month, uh, I was like triple what I could remember when I first started it because I kept track of it. Now, like, now imagine if it wasn't a simple assignment game with the colors and the tones, but actually, you know, something a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I, 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 that was just a simple example. But yeah, I mean. I mean, Portal and Portal 2 uh, is is more complicated and, and more sophisticated, but again, it makes... There are many, the, there's so many puzzle games out there that I think if if you wanted to train your brain, mm -hmm. and games are so easy to get now thanks to Steam and other digital distribution platforms, if, if you want to train your brain and you want to, you know, kind of not sit down and read, even though, uh, you know, reading, good, do it, do as much as you can. Um... There are easy ways to get problem-solving games, puzzle games, you know, get them into your home, get them into your life, and start playing them that I think are going to be vastly superior than, you know, exercising your brain. You know, forcing yourself to play these little browser games that are, you know, proven to help you remember things. Instead, do something that's fun, you know, play a video game, and, you know, get engaged. Yeah, be entertained. You're right because playing some of those mind games, uh, as you say, are they get laborious. They 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 they're, they're not fun. But uh, playing some Sci like, scientifically they work. But I mean, yeah. But if you can if you can wrap it and 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 make it fun, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be a double winner for you. Exactly. Yeah. Do you like do you like playing Portal? Have you played Portal both versions? I, I played the original Portal. Came with uh, the orange box, and that was a really great game. And uh, Portal Two, I played. Portal 2 was actually unique in that it had a co-op, so, you know, if you have another 70-year-old uh, with you and you wanted to co-op with it, you know, mm -hmm. how, how long does it take two 70-year-olds to beat Portal 2 would be a hilarious video. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, I played Portal 1, Portal 2, and I played Portal 2 single and co-op all the way through. Right. Both were very enjoyable. And, it, it, you know, like, Craig, you know the concept of Portal 1. Now imagine Portal 2 where you're playing with someone else and you have to use two sets of portals to yeah. solve puzzles. Well, you know, it, it takes you, timing and you know, engagement. Did you, did you find that after you finished playing it that you were, you were better for it in some, in some way or aspect? That See, had? I just enjoyed the experience. So, I, I mean, I totally was because I, you know, I remember it and I still remember it. It was a very fun game, so it was, you know. But I'm not. Regardless, I'm not. It was. The jingle was when I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm saying, regardless of spatial co cognition and things like that, it doesn't matter because I enjoyed it. But I, you know, I don't know how to measure that kind of thing. I'm not sitting here and saying, "Geez, I don't remember why I had, you know, why I had for breakfast two days ago." Yeah. I'm. I, I'm not comparing it to anything. Okay, and see, and that's where the game like Simon or whatever it was called, you know, the. Uh, where you could, because I could actually measure it, because I knew how many sequences I could remember how far, and by the time I was finished playing it, you know, like about three months later I was playing it, I was remembering sequences were, that were at least three times or longer than when I first started it. So it was quantifiable. I was actually able to measure it. Uh, so that's, you know, I understand what you're saying about that. You can't do that really with Portal, but there are some games where you can. You know, you can see where you start. You yeah, you can, but I mean, let's let's say baseline. If you're playing video games, it's good for you because that I I, I like that stance personally. Video yeah. games are good for you. I like that. Okay. <laughs> um, now, admittedly, Call of Duty, you know, you're getting into a gray area there, uh, you know, Battlefield, what have you. But it's uh no, it, it it's just it's good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have time for one more story. Okay, uh, we got to do something that's really quick then. Um, oh, well, I, I mean, if you don't mind, I have one real quick. I was going to talk about how you can buy the Mona Lisa for twenty-five grand. Oh yeah, sure. You want to do that one? Yeah, that's or, pretty interesting. Okay. 
Well, again, this is according to Money Magazine. Uh, it's uh, you you can buy the Mona Lisa now for twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, it's a forgery rather than the real Mona Lisa, obviously, but the asking price is still pretty steep, according to this article. Uh, the world's most famous portrait hangs on the wall at the Louvre. It's not for sale, and it's hard to imagine that it will ever will go on the market. But perhaps the next best thing went on sale this week at a coffee shop in Manhattan Soho neighborhood. The Bedford Bowery blog reports that a painting that some are calling the Fona Lisa <laughs> is hanging on the wall at the Mercer Street Think Coffee Shop. The portrait is most definitely for sale with an asking price of $25,000. Such a sum for what's admittedly a forgery might seem absurd until you learn that the creator of this artwork, while not a household name like Leonardo da Vinci, is a fairly famous, even infamous in his own right. Uh, the remarkably high-quality forgery was done by Mark Landis, a notorious art forger who has been profiled by the likes of The New Yorker and has done copies of artworks by sources ranging from Picasso to Disney. The quality of his reproductions has been good enough to fool dozens of museums, including the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Landis is also the subject of a new documentary called Art and Craft, and apparently the makers of the film approached Think Coffee recently with a proposal to hang Landis' faux version of the Mona Lisa on the walls and sell it. By one account, Landis has completed the uh, faux Lisa in just, the phone Lisa, in just 90 minutes. Wow. In a recent Ask Me Anything session on Reddit, however, the painter said that the reproduction of the Mona Lisa was the most challenging forgery he's ever done. He says, it took me a whole weekend. <laughs> oh, my. And he wrote in response to a question on the forum. When asked how he was able to do such intricate work and so quickly, Landis responded, well, it's like a magic trick, you know. If I told people, it wouldn't be worth anything anymore. Hmm. Surprisingly, Landis says that he has never benefited financially from his forgeries. In most cases, he simply donated them to institutions. Uh, he was busted but not arrested in 2010, and, pro and proceeds from the sale of his phone Elisa are intended to go to the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art, which is located in the uh, Mississippi town where Landis is from, and which, fittingly, was duped in the past in, into accepting a forgery by Landis. So there you go. Uh, I'm looking at it, the image. I mean, it looks it looks amazingly real. You know. Oh yeah, no, it it, it it's uh, when what? when they say that they fooled museums, you can see why. Yeah, but uh, is it is it really? Did he sit down and paint this thing by hand, or is it? See, now like... that's the magic trick I was going to ask you about. Yeah. What do you think the magic trick is? Because I think he scanned it. It's a paint my numbers. Yeah, I think he just scanned. I put it into a high quality scanner, you know, and 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 then uh, and then uh, uh, reproduced it. But of course, it has to have texture and three dimensional, which you can do. Some 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 uh, some scanners or some printers will do See, that. Now. I think he is an actual artist. He paints, he has canvases, and he paints these things for real. Mm -hmm. But he probably has some way to break it down. You know, maybe he has a sharp eye, maybe he has you know something else. But I think he can actually you know take a high quality scan because most of these really really famous pieces of art they have been scanned and saved on the internet somewhere. You know, in case they were ever damaged, yeah. um, he can find really high quality you know blueprints for what he's painting, and then he can just spend the weekend. You know, using his natural talent and forging these. Yeah, because um, it's definitely not you know. Hey, let's send the Mona Lisa to Kinkos and see if they'll print it out for me. <laughs> in a, you know, eighteen by twenty. Yeah, but you know, there are those there are machines like that that can do that. You know, and uh, so if it, Cole, Cole Harry uses it with his uh, portrait. You know, behind the mantle. Yeah. That, that he prints out. It, it you know he he jokes that it takes like you know three or four toner cartridges just to do one one painting, but it's a uh, I think he's such a good painter that he finds high quality pictures of these and then he paints them all by himself. You think he, you think he starts with the copy there and then he t he hand paints over it to you know for the mm, No, not even that. I think he starts with a blank canvas and he goes, you know, he he he's not making up composition, he's not make, making up subject, he's not making up anything that has to do but, with original art. He's just copying what is already laid out in front no, of him. That's easy. That's not an easy thing to do. You can't. No, I mean, it's not. But he's really good at what he does. I mean, I mean, that's he's, why he's famous. 
he, I mean, he's doing all different styles. I mean, he's doing Da Vinci. He's doing, uh, doing Picasso. Uh, I don't know if he's done, doing a Van Gogh. I mean, I mean, I mean, those things are really hard to reproduce. You know? uh, yeah. Well, twenty five twenty five thousand dollars for a fake, you know, for a fake painting yeah. isn't exactly, you know, saying someone's an amateur. Well, as long, as long as people know that it's a fake and and he's selling it at that, then he's not breaking any laws. Then I mean, he's just taking an image and he's 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 repainting it. You know. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I think he's just really good yeah. at what he does, and what he does is recreates paintings. Wow. Uh, I'd like to have a talent like that. I, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's it's not a talent akin to you know Da Vinci. Who was, you know, able to create these paintings of his own, you know, of his own imagination, but it's still a very great talent. I think that if he can do that, then he should be able to paint anything, you know, uh, from scratch. He probably does have his own, you it, know, it, artwork, but you know, that's not what's making his headlines. No, that isn't. That isn't that what's making the headlines. Uh well, what can I say? Uh, we're we're pretty much out of time here. Uh, very interesting story, though. Um, Again, I want to thank Crestron uh, for being with us here, uh, um, talking about their Crestron systems. And uh, um, ninety seconds. Tomorrow, we're gonna to have our good buddy Nathan Evans, the managing editor of Pop Zara magazine, is gonna be with us for both hours. It's always fun having Nathan because we 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 pick uh, different stories. We talk everything from technology to games to movies. I mean, you name it. Because PopZara.com deals with all those things, and uh, Nathan's a uh, uh, certainly well versed on on most of those topics, so he's going to be joining us uh, for both hours uh, on com Computer America. And you know what? Sixty seconds. Well, he's going to recant. Remember, he said there was going to be no Apple Watch. There was going to be no i what we were calling an iWatch at the time. You know, he was giving. Are you going to rake him over the coals for that? Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> he's expecting it. <laughs> but that's okay. He's a good sport. And uh, uh, I actually did an interview, a live interview. Uh, Yesterday with him for the Pop Zara um, um, website, and I wasn't even invited. No, you were in school. Otherwise, ah. I didn't yeah, I was gonna say. Wait, yesterday? No, I was here. I was home. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well we can do it again. We can do it again. No, you? no, no, no. I, I'm not. <laughs> we're good here. Just end the show. Just, just, just cut the music. Just end it now. Forget it. So they will have Nathan Evans here tomorrow night, and hopefully you will all be here with us. So until tomorrow night. This is Craig Crossman Ten hoping that your seconds. hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you tomorrow night. Ah, forget it. <laughs> thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. All right. So, again, thanks, everybody, uh, for watching us on our Hangouts, on our live video streaming page brought to you by Other World Computing. <laughs> ben is frustrated. <laughs> Hurts. <laughs> He's pouting. <laughs> exactly. <Hurt my> soul. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow night. It should be a fun show. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>